Well, good evening. It's good to see you tonight. I know what you're thinking. That's not Smed or Daniel. What we do, open your Bibles to Psalm 107. 107, that's what we'll do. Psalm 107, this is a long psalm, takes up about two and a half pages of my Bible. And uh, we might be setting records tonight in terms of exposition anyway. But we're going to look at this passage, and I hope we'll be blessed by it. I do have a question for you while you're turning there. Did Thanksgiving come easy to you? Did Thanksgiving this year come easy to you? Did gratitude come easy to you? Uh, it's an important question, and Psalm 107 is in our Bibles to recalibrate our hearts around Thanksgiving and gratitude. Let's go ahead and read our passage, and then we will go ahead and work our way through it. Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the, land, or from the hand of the adversary, and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness, in the desert region, they did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to, to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of, the, of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron asunder. Fools, because of the rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent, word, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind which lifted the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens and went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still, so, that the, so the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet, so he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of people and praise him at the seat of the elders. He changes rivers into wilderness and springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And he makes the hungry dwell, and there he makes the hungry dwell, so that they may establish an inhabited city, and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. 
He also blesses them and they multiply greatly. And he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in a pathless waste. But he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction and makes his families like a flock. The upright see it and are glad, but all unrighteousness shuts its mouth. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. Well, that's a long psalm. There are a lot of verses there. We're going to work our way all the way through them. We're going to see a lot of repetition. I think you saw man's dependence on God in this psalm. I think that you saw God rescuing man from a variety of, of, uh, of calamities. And so let's go through each one of these. In particular, there's, there's four groups here described that are in a calamity of one kind or another. The, the first two, I'm sorry, the, the first and the last, if you notice, are in calamities that are just too big for them. They, they don't know what to do with them and they've, they've gotten to their wit's end, you can see with the sailors, right? And the two in the middle are in calamities of their own making. They're, they're in trouble that they brought on to themselves. And so you can kind of see that as we work our way through that. Um, this psalm, Psalm 107, scholars have, have brought questions and curiosities like, are some of these circumstances descriptions of the exodus or exiles coming back from Babylon? Or is the one about the sailors, was that uh, the psalmist's description of the sailors' perspective in Jonah? And, and really, this, th that may or may not be the case. It may or may not be the case that the psalmist has uh, specific circumstances in mind as he writes, but if... if that was important. He would have told us. And, and, um, but what, what he does tell us is, is uh, clear. The main point of this psalm is helpful to everyone because it might describe anyone who reads it. The main point of this psalm for the reader is that you might never get over God's kindness to save. That you would never get over God's kindness to save. I've titled this, message responding to search and rescue responding to search and rescue because that is what we see in this psalm we see man's response to god's saving work in the lives of the redeemed so if you're saved don't let this get lost on you don't let this don't let your salvation god's work in your life get lost on you and and uh, if you're not if you'd say, well, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm at. Let this psalm redirect your attention from your own abilities to God's abilities to save and to rescue. So again, the, the main point of this psalm is that, that you'd never let God's saving work in your life get lost on you. In fact, the, the source of gratitude that comes from this psalm ought to, ought to remind you that, that uh, the excitement of salvation ought to stay fresh through your entire Christian life your entire Christian life. So with that, we're going to look at the psalm and look at five reasons to praise God for his loving kindness to rescue. Five reasons to praise God for his loving kindness to rescue. Go ahead and look at verse one. This is a banner over the entire psalm, and this kind of tees up the rest of the passage. It says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Over and over, you see the call to praise, the response in giving thanks. And our prayer is, in giving thanks is, is strengthened when we recall his saving work. Isn't that true? Next, next week is a baptism Sunday. That's what uh, you might benefit from as you recall your own salvation, listening to the testimony of people who have been saved and are praising God for the saving work in his life. So in, in that way, this psalm can remind us about his wonderful work in the lives of sinners. And you see that term throughout the psalm four or five times. You see God's wonderful acts, his, his wonders among men. And the idea behind that concept in this psalm are things that are next to impossible, things that are only God can do. That same phrase, the, the word that's used there, 
is used in Job when, in, when God says in Job 37, stand and consider the wonders of God. Do you ever think about that? Do you, do you think about the salvation work that he does, the search and rescue that he does in the lives of sinners, and, and put that in the same category in terms of wonder as him sinking the foundations of the earth? Wow. Wow. The Bible puts those in the same category. They, 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 the Bible uses the same words to describe those two very things. It's incredible. So con- consider God's wonderful acts. Okay, five reasons. Let's start in verse two properly. The first reason we can praise God for his loving kindness is that he establishes the ones that he redeems. He establishes the ones that he redeems. This first group are the lost, the scattered, the spiritually malnourished. This is a, uh, a group described, um, this, this group is described as a group of people that are doing life without a map. They're just doing life without a map. They're wandering, they're scattered, they don't know where to go. When I was, uh, one of the first jobs that I had out of high school was uh, a courier. I was a courier in town here in Phoenix, and I had a map. I didn't have an iPhone at that time. I had the map where you flip over and go from A1, to, okay, A1 equals B3, okay, gotta go this, and, and you figure out where to go by the map. Well, now I don't leave my neighborhood without checking my map. What is, can I save one minute <laughs> taking the 60? Because it's totally worth it. <laughs> but this first group's doing life without a map. Look at verse uh, 2 through 5. It says, Let the redeemed say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. He gathered them from lands, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. They wandered in a wilderness in the desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They're hungry, thirsty. Their souls fainted within them. Doing life without God's word is like doing life without a map. Direction is hard to come by. Discernment dries up when you're doing life without God's word. And even a believer can experience this. And if you put your Bible down and don't pick it up for the next week, I mean, how, how do you make decisions? Where, where do the, where, you start to become uh, detached from principle if you're not opening up God's word and saying, okay, how should I be thinking rightly about what I'm walking through? So doing life without God's word, well, discernment dries up. Purpose becomes elusive. All those why questions start to to creep in. Why why am I doing that again? What am I doing? You increasingly become lost, alone. So what do you do when you're doing life without a map, without God's word? Look at verse 6. You cry out to the Lord in your trouble. That's what you do. In the story, he says he delivered them out of their distresses and led them also by a straight way. Literally, he he made the the rough ground level to go to an inhabited city. So he brings their wandering to an end, and he establishes the ones that he redeems. Verses 8 and 9 So you start to hear this refrain that gets repeated over and over in Psalm 107. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Well, why in this case? For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and he and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. You know, the Lord uh, never saves someone and leaves them isolated. He establishes the ones that he saved. The lost, the wandering, he brings to a congregation. He brings to a body to do life with. We can be grateful for that. We can praise the Lord for that. Let's look at the second group. Group two, beginning in verse 10, describes describes how we can thank the Lord because he breaks our false confidence. He breaks our false confidence. Group two are rebels. There are those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains. These are rebels who are imprisoned because of disobedience. Verses 10 through 16 describe those who suffer the consequence of ignoring God's instruction. 
These are people who have God's word in their possession, but they've decided that they know better. This group has access to God's word, but has decided they might have a better way. And so they suffer the consequences of walking their better way. They have more confidence in themselves than they do in God. Now, let's face it, face it there, there is an extra step in discerning and making decisions when you have to say, okay, wait, let me stop and let me go open my Bible and plant myself once again in why I do what I do. God has saved me. I need to make decisions based on the principles that come from God's word. So there is an extra step there. And it's certainly worth it. You can see in this group. This is a warning against a prideful heart. Look at verse 11. They had rebelled against God's word and spurned the counsel of the Most High. That was the outcome of their rebellion. And if you look back in verse 10, it says, these, were, these are uh, prisoners in misery and chains. You could actually uh, translate that by saying, prisoners of misery and chains. They're prisoners of misery. You don't necessarily need to be physically imprisoned for this to apply. This is uh, situational affliction brought on by self. Suppressing God's word is never a good idea. Suppressing God's counsel, a uh, terrible idea. What's that look like for someone who would, that has God's word, has access to God's word, and yet decides to ignore it? This is what it would look like. Ignoring, uh, ignoring uh, the, the uh, opportunity to search out the scriptures, to, to be informed about how to make decisions and, and how to walk. So ignoring to search out the scriptures yourself. Ignoring to seek godly counsel. I'm not sure if you've experienced uh, a trouble or a, a circumstance where you say, I'm not sure how to get out of this, but I'm too embarrassed to go get godly counsel to help me figure out a way out. That's ignoring godly counsel. If you have access to godly counsel, that's a gift. The world doesn't have that. So don't ignore it. Ignoring clear exhortation. It uh, sounds silly to be reminded of this, but exhortation uh, is not to be ignored. <laughs> exhortation is something you must obey, walk in. Spurning the counsel of the Most High is to treat God's word irreverently or discard it altogether. And you know, that it can be subtle in a digital age where we have a menu of counselors. We can accumulate counsel uh, however we would like and decide what counsel fits the day. Well, you kind of become your own counselor by doing that. Um, God has, has put you into a body where there are counselors. There's counselors that will even be held accountable for their counsel. And so it's a good thing. It's, it's, a, it's a gift to have the, the, the counsel and the congregation around you. God's word. You can be assured that God does not allow his people to rebel peacefully. He disciplines the ones that he loves, and that's exactly what we see here. Look at verse 12. Therefore, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Sometimes it's a hard lesson to learn when our way doesn't go the way we thought it was going to. Maybe ignoring God's counsel was a bad idea. But God often rescues his people by bringing them to a place where there is no one else to help. I have a prediction. It's not very bold. But next week, we have baptisms. And you will hear over and over, God brought me to a place where I had no more answers. God took away everything I was used to. God brought me to rock bottom. No more options. What will Baptism Sunday next week have in common with this psalm? Verse 13. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke apart their bands. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his 
wonders to the sons of men. For he shattered the gates of bronze and cut off the bars asunder. Don't let that get lost on you, right? Don't let God's kindness to save you get lost on you. This, this psalm serves as a reminder that the freshness of excitement that you experienced when you were first saved ought to be fresh through your entire Christian life. Group three, verse 17. Fools. That's who this group is, fools. Fools. Because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food, and they grew and they drew near to the gates of death. This group describes the willfully uninformed and the natural outcome of their ways. So the willfully uninformed and the natural outcome of the ways. This is the group, this is the, the person you know who knows where the church is, knows who goes to that church and stays way clear of those people. I know it's over there. I want nothing to do with it. I, I, I know there's something there. I can't really accuse them of anything wrong, but I just don't want any part of it. That's what this group is. Fools. Absolute fools. How does the Bible describe a fool? We can be reminded of that. Fools mock sin. Um, what a travesty. Fools, fools look at sin, and, and not only do they participate in it, but they understand that it's offense, it's offense against God, and they mock it. They, they run into it headlong. Fools are unteachable. They learn nothing from discipline, Proverbs 16, 22 says. What a travesty that is. Fools despise wisdom, despise instruction, Proverbs 1, 7. And fools are given to anger. Fools are given to anger. That, that is, anger is what describes a fool. Job 5.2. A fool is someone who disassociates themselves from God and disassociates themselves from God's instruction. How does a fool get to be a fool? This would be good for us to just be reminded of so we never wind up there. Verse 17a, a fool has a rebellious disposition. They have a rebellious disposition. When they see instruction, when a fool sees uh, the right way, they just want to rebel. I want to do it another way and let my way be known. They have a rebellious disposition. Iniquity, 17b. Iniquity is just their way. They, they sin and sin and sin, and they're totally cool with it. The fool becomes a fool by abhorring spiritual food. That's the idea here in verse 18a. Therefore, I'm sorry, their, their soul abhorred all kinds of food. This wasn't a lack of opportunity. This is a willful objection, a strong arming to spiritual food, spiritual nutrition. A fool gravitates towards destruction Look at 17, or I'm sorry, 18b, and they grew near to the gates of death. No, no self-imposed boundaries. A fool doesn't draw a line in the sand and says, and to, to say, I, I need to know that I can't cross that line. No self-imposed boundaries. They just kind of gravitate towards death. Foolish life is filled with unnecessary affliction. And make no mistake, a willful separation from him now will become irreversible at death. Ultimately, a fool dies from the lack of understanding. Proverbs 10.21. Uh, and that's where the psalmist introduces us to the fool, at the threshold of death. But you know what? There is hope for the fool even at the threshold of death. Look at verse 19. Then they cried out to the Lord 
in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Distresses in the plural, um, it continues to come up in the plural. Uh, fools die from a variety of distresses. Uh, there's not one path away from God. There are many paths away from God. There's only one path to God. Verse 20 says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Well, it's a Sunday night. You're all here, not strong-arming the opportunity to come and sit under God's word and be affected by it. So this group may not be the the first group you run to to self-diagnose, and that's probably true. One thing that you, you don't want to miss, though, is that the fool responded the right way. He, he, he didn't claim the victim. This is a, a rebuke of self-pity. The fool would have every reason to say, you know what, I deserve this. I got here, and I'm just going to have to eat it. You know, the, the fool has an opportunity, to, to, even the fool, he has the opportunity to cry out to the Lord. This reminds me of the thief on the cross right? At the threshold of death, mocking God. And then something changed. After hanging there in silence, says, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? I mean, moments from death. And how did Jesus respond? He said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Did he deserve that? Ten minutes earlier, he was just casting insults at the king of the universe. While the king of the universe was hanging on a cross, suffering. He'd be the first one to go, right? No. God's full of loving kindness, even to a fool, at the threshold of death. Look at verse uh, 21 and 22. This verse uh, 22 is unique to to the passage. Uh, beginning in verse 21, it says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Um, that's illustrative. Uh, the uh, Hebrew ear would have heard this and, and what may have come to mind, uh, as in my imagination, what would have come to mind in the Hebrew's imagination, would be someone who was the town fool, Right? The, the bumbling fool walking around town, always cursing God, and then there you are, you're going to the altar, you're bringing your burnt sacrifice, just like you have over and over and over. And there's the fool, the, 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 the town idiot, bringing a sacrifice to the Lord and singing joyfully about what God has done in his life. Th- that's the, the level of wonder, the jaw drop, that the psalmist intends the reader to, to maintain through his life. Wow, that's incredible. No one would have expected the fool to be saved, but he was saved. And we can rejoice in that too. Fourth point, how can we uh, praise God? We can praise God fourthly because he exposes our limitations. He exposes our limitations. Verse 23, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters. They have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. These are no fools at all. In fact, these are shrewd businessmen who could navigate just by looking at the stars. Um, I I was in a ship once, and I got onto a ship, and we were ready to embark. Sun's going down. This is in the Red Sea. We were going about 50 miles out. And I'm always interested in gear. want to see what they've got up there. So went up to the wheelhouse and um, looking for the captain. It's kind of like to know who's, who's at the helm. <laughs> and uh, we get up to the bridge. And uh, I'm expecting to see all the things you might expect on, on, on a ship. Um, GPS, radar, sonar, all kinds of lights and knobs and buttons and wheels. <laughs> Get up into the bridge, open the door. It's dark. He's got a hammock and one of those old IBM green screens, unplugged. 
Do you ever have one of those clues? <laughs> I'm not sure if I should be here. <laughs> I said, Captain, where's your GPS? GPS. Yeah. Where's your GPS? Where's your map? I'm, looking, I'm 20 years old again looking for my map, right? <laughs> and, and he says, huh, stars. No, really, where, like, where's the GPS? Stars. Sun's going down. <laughs> Are you serious? Could you do that? Could you, could you get in a ship and, and navigate the waters by looking at the stars? I mean, that's how it's been done mostly. These are no fools at all. These are, are smart, smart businessmen who are doing international trade. And while they're doing it, they get to see the sunrise. They get to see the sunset. And I can assure you, in the middle of the ocean, the sunrise and the sunset are the most beautiful things that a sailor can see. Absolutely beautiful. They see the wonders among men. They see God's works even in the sea. Under the sea, they see whales. They see all kinds of sea life. They sit under God's canopy that he stretched out, Isaiah says, just in awe. They, they're a witness to God's creation if there ever was one. But like I said, these are no fools. These are capable men. This, this group describes men who are capable and resourceful. This is international logistics before it was a problem hear a lot about that in the news right now. Well, it's been a thing for a long time. What is logistics? Well, logistics is a problem that needs to be solved. That's the definition of logistics. And they've been solving it for a long, long time. But what is, what, why is this group here? These aren't fools. These guys aren't lost. They know exactly where they are. Why is this group among them? Well, God wants even the shrewd, the accomplished the successful to understand that they are no less dependent on him than the fool. They are absolutely dependent on the Lord. But why is that? Why, did, why, why does he need to convey that? Well, because, well, le left to your own success, you'd begin taking credit for it, wouldn't you? Maybe you're uh, successful in business. Maybe you've, you were a straight-A student. Um, have had lots of opportunities and nailed every one of them. Maybe you played sports. Maybe you've just generally been an acceptable person. Everyone wants to know you, and there's just general success that follows you. Well, you need to be reminded that you are no less dependent than the fool that you walk by. So don't let God's kindness get lost on you. God's kindness might come to you by exposing your limitations. Look at verse 25. He says, For he spoke, that's God, and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens, and they went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man, and they were at their wits' end. You see how, uh, how easy it was for God to bewilder the best of them? See what he did? Just blew on them. And the stability left them. No more reliable footing. Uh, no more predictable ground. Have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been in that scenario where all of a sudden things change? Circumstances are no longer predictable. Uh, people that you counted on are no longer dependable. Has that ever happened? Well, God is in that moment exposing your limitations. Verse 26, what did that look like for these men? Their soul melted. Literally, uh, their soul came apart. They came unraveled, came unglued. They reeled and staggered. The idea there is to literally shake, shake, shake from fear. You ever got a phone call, hung up, and physically you, you, you're shaken? That's what's described here. And that what is most uh, acute probably for these men who are so accomplished 
They were at their wit's end, literally. Their wisdom was proven confused. Their wisdom was proven confused all by God simply blowing the wind. Now, remember, this group, and this group, this was not punishment, but this is exactly what God needed to bring to them, to, to bring them to dependence. So, God brought them exactly what they needed in order for them to depend on him completely. Sometimes he needs to expose our limitations in order for us to get there. And I, I, I know that it's, it's intuitive for us to praise God for the outcomes, but you need to remember, we, we ought to praise God for the means. God, God didn't bring us to repentance with more or less than what was perfect for us, than more or less than what was exactly what each one of us individually needed to come to repentance. Here is again in verse 28. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their safe haven. I'm sorry, their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for the wonders, his wonders among the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people. That's exactly where they wanted to be. They wanted to be not alone in the sea, in the dark, but with a congregation of people. And God always saves us to a congregation. He saves us to a body. Let them praise him at the seat of the elders. If you cry out to God and put your trust in him, he'll bring you to safety. For the sailors, that safety was safe harbor. For the thief, it was heaven. But you can be rest assured that either way, God is faithful to those who depend on him. He is the God that transforms that's point number five in your outline. He is the God that transforms, and we can praise him for that. This last section is not like the other, others. It reads differently. It describes the provision to the redeemed beyond his work to rescue them. It would be enough to be delivered from calamity, right? Just to be delivered from calamity? <laughs> Um, but in this section, verses 33 through 34, it puts an exclamation point on God's desire to transform not only his people, but to prosper them. There's all kinds of good things in this next section. And it seems like it's teed up for a prosperity gospel message, except for the first two verses. <laughs> Let's read them. Verse 33, he changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Oh, no prosperity gospel in those verses. <laughs> you know, prosperity preachers draw too close a correlation between God's calling and God's desire to prosper them. They skip over why there's a lack of resource and safety in the first place. But it is true that God's provision for the upright is exceedingly kind. Look at verse 35. I'll, I'm going to read all the way through 30 or 41, and then we'll talk about that. 35. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water, and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry dwell, so that they may establish an inhabited city, and sow fields, and plant vineyards, and gather a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them, and they multiply greatly, and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes, that would be their oppressors, and makes them wander in a pathless waste. But he sets the needy securely on high, away from affliction, and makes his families like a flock. Have you ever doubted God's ability? 
Have you ever said, well, you know, I trust him, but there's really not much here to work with? Your assessment of circumstances has nothing to do, no correlation, no bearing on God's ability to change things. An arid landscape is no obstacle for the, for the Lord. He lacks no resource. And look how he responds to those who look to him as their source of life. Habitation, that is, you're no longer alone. We continue to see that in each group, and we see that now. Verse 37, a productive life. He desires a productive life for his people. You see in verses 38 and 39, safety and multiplication. And of course, he repays oppressors for oppressing his people. Those are God's intention, intentions for his people. You might say, well, it doesn't sound a whole lot like my experience. Well, not now, later. You can trust in that. You know what it does sound like? It sounds like everything that he has in store for his people. When Christ returns, friends, and establishes his kingdom on earth, he will transform our bodies. No more sickness, no more fear of sickness. Our provision will come like it did to Adam before the curse. No more toil of the brow and frustrated labor. And he'll transform the land. I don't think we talk about that enough. He will transform the land. In fact, he'll do that so much so that everyone who passes through Israel, according to Ezekiel, will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. That's the destination he has for us. That's what he has in store for us. Back at 41. But he sets the needy securely on high, away from affliction. The object of God's affection are the needy. That's something you need to remember from this psalm. The object of God's affection are the needy. Are you needy? Are you needy or do you think you've got a good handle on things? Got it figured out. That's what this psalm rebukes. Remain needy. We are needy. The difference between someone who is redeemed and someone who is not redeemed is not that they are needy. All of us are needy. Those who are not redeemed are needy, and those who are redeemed are needy. The difference is those who are redeemed cry out to the Lord for his help in their trouble. Verse 43, who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. Who is wise? We see this throughout Scripture. Uh, passages finish with that question often in the Bible. Well, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So who are the wise? Those who fear the Lord. I hope that next week, Everyone here tonight is, is there Sunday morning to hear the, the body, the, the congregation here at Grace Bible Church rejoice over the people who have experienced the same as Psalm 107. Let us consider the loving kindness of the Lord and never get over it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a great God who saves, who saves those who we wouldn't save. Your loving kindness exceeds ours. You are too wonderful for, for us to comprehend, and yet we are totally dependent on you. Father, keep us in a place where we are needy, where we know our needfulness. We know we need to depend on you, Lord. Father, thank you for this psalm. Thank you for this reminder, and I pray uh, your blessing on next week as we get to hear from people among our own con congregation of your long loving kindness in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.